Editing architectural photography in particular, architectural interiors, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. We'll have a little walk through Lightroom and Photoshop to create our finished result. So let's have a look at what we're dealing with. Well, oh dear, look at this bulbous mess. This was shot at 16 millimeters. So we've got all that barrel distortion going on. It looks pretty hideous. The color balance is all over the place at the moment. And this is how it's shot. I'll always shoot on auto white balance, hoping that my camera's kind of locking in on that white. But here it's really missed the mark. So there is a lot to fix in this photo. And you may be thinking, well, why didn't you just get further back, not shoot at 16 mil? You wouldn't have such distortion. But unfortunately, this kitchen space I was shooting in had a wall right behind where the camera is set up. And the camera is actually on a shelf right now. It's not even on a tripod, just to try and allow me to get a front on shot of the kitchen, which is what I normally like to deliver to my kitchen designer clients. So let's see what we can do about fixing it up. The first thing I wanna do is make sure that we're in camera neutral rather than the standard Adobe. And then what I'm gonna do is just pick what I feel is a nice neutral color balance. Something like that might not be too bad. And as I'm picking the colors, I'm looking at the Kelvin temperature. So 4250 was when I picked up around here, 4200. And I also clicked here and got a very different color balance. That was 3900. I kind of want to go somewhere in between the two of those. So I might just go 4050, lock that in. And the astute viewers among you may have realized that this is a set of five images here. So in Lightroom, if I press N on my keyboard, we will see the complete set here. And the reason that I shoot five images is so that I have the best of the high dynamic range that I want. So for example, I have a good exposure for outside of the windows, and that is two stops underneath my base exposure, and that's fine for this example. And I also have a shot that is two stops brighter, and that gives me all this lovely detail in the shadows as well. And somebody mentioned to me in the comments the other day that they don't need to shoot a bracketed set because they shoot with the mighty D800 and the D610 and that has enough dynamic range not to need to do this. Now, bear in mind, I shoot with a Nikon, Nikon D850, which has a higher dynamic range than both of those cameras. And it's very rare when you're shooting interior architectural spaces that the dynamic range gives you good enough quality in the brightest highlights and the darkest shadows. Yet sometimes you can hack it and get away with it and pull back the highlights, boost the shadows, and you're good for a, how do I put this without being rude, but a file that is mediocre at best. The shadow details are not gonna be noiseless. You're not gonna have a nice clean file there. And also the highlights, they can lose color information really quickly when you're trying to pull back an extreme uh, dynamic range. You just don't have it in one file, even with a beautiful camera like the rather old now, Nikon D810, I think it was, he was using. So I use the D850, still I prefer to shoot a bracketed set of at least five. Sometimes I will even push my bracketed set to seven or nine images just to cover a wider dynamic range if the contrast in the scene between the highlights outside, the very bright sun, let's say, and quite a dark interior, I will just make sure I'm covering my bases and then I can pull back the best information that exists in the correct file in that series. Let me show you what I mean and why I consider this to be a best practice. So this isn't a particularly contrasty scene by any means. However, you can still run into difficulty with a single exposure. You can see if I drop the exposure down here, we haven't really got any detail in these highlights here. Whereas if I jump to the darker exposure and just jump up here, you can actually see if I drop the exposure here, there is actually even detail in that. Not that you necessarily want to bring that back. However, it is there if you do want to. Whereas this file doesn't have that detail there. It's just a muddy gray. And also, I don't know if it's gonna show up on YouTube or not. However, on my monitor, which I'm lucky enough to have an exceptionally high color accuracy, I can see color banding going on in this area here. And that comes down to the fact that we are using just a single image and trying to pull back all of that detail throughout this image. And we haven't even looked at the shadows yet. I'm just gonna jump into a greater magnification. And let's say we wanted to boost up the information in the shadows here. You can see the high level of noise that we have in this area here. Whereas if we could steal the shadows from this photo, the brighter exposure, you can see that we have a similar exposure level of the shadows between these two files now. However, this brighter exposure, which is overexposed in most of the photo, 
it is perfect and so much cleaner in the shadows. So if we use the best bits from the exposure through the bracketed set, we can deliver a file to our client that is the optimum quality that we possibly can. Now, if you're somebody who has asked in previous videos, do I shoot Flambian and just assume that I always use this technique, just to clean that up, I don't. I will choose the technique that I think is most appropriate for the situation. And in this situation, for pretty much every series of images I shot of this kitchen, I was not using flash. I did try it on a couple of examples and it didn't really work out. It wasn't really like adding any additional benefit to me. Uh, so going the flambient route just isn't an option for me in this particular example. I will cover a flambient tutorial if you guys want me to. So write flambient in the comments if you do want me to cover that. But for now, this is my preferred method. If I can go this way, I will. So I've shown in the past how we can work on three separate files, bring them in as separate layers into Photoshop, but a way I prefer to work with these files is to actually select all five, press Control H on my keyboard, and that is gonna bring me into the HDR merge tool. All I need to do is make sure we are auto aligned. I'm not gonna worry about auto settings, but I will keep the deghosting amount just on and keep it to low, just in case we get any movement in any of these leaves out there, that's gonna sort that out and I will create a stack so it's gonna drop my HDR merged version onto the top of these photos. Now, just as an aside to this to help you with your workflow, what I like to do once I've brought my photos into Lightroom and I've created stacks of the uh, bracketed images that are gonna make up one single photo, I go through and I automate that HDR process just by selecting them all, press Control H, and that's going to make an HDR merged file of each of those bracketed sets now, the HDR merged file isn't gonna miraculously bring out all our highlight and shadow detail as if we are tone mapping. That's something different. The HDR merged file that we have access to here is literally one file now that has all of that lovely rich highlight and shadow information available to us, but it's still up to us as photo editors to bring back the parts that we want. And that's what we're gonna do now once we just straightened up this geometry. So we're now working on the HDR merged file here, and I'm just gonna add a couple of corrections to this or things that I like to do. And usually I will have these settings sort of baked into my file once they're actually brought into Lightroom. So a massive step up is to actually add profile corrections. And as you can see, that's got rid of those barrel distortions. But one thing we absolutely have to do is just sort out the geometry. Because I have a bit of a tilt going on here, you can see that we have convergence of those lines. And so I'm just gonna make sure that our sides are nice and straight and also our horizontals as well. So I'm just gonna come up here to the, to the skylights and just throw a line on there. And I could go along the bottom of the kitchen bench top here and try and pull a nice straight line there. Or alternatively, I could trust that the floor manufacturer has followed a nice true line for his tiling. And then I can just look for the point where this tile intersects here. And that carries on right the way across the front here and look for that point again there. Because the closer you can get your guides to the perimeter of the photo, the more accurate that geometry correction is gonna be. So I'm just gonna press the backslash key on our keyboard to see our before, and this is our after. So before and after. Now we haven't done any basic corrections, tone curve corrections, nothing. So let's create what I like to think of as our base edit. This is gonna look pretty good, but it's still gonna need some work doing to it. Now, just because we have all the highlight and the shadow detail baked into this file, it doesn't give us a carte blanche just to come in and just start to try and recover all of that by moving these slides around. It's just not going to look particularly good doing that. So I'm just gonna reset these and we're gonna go again. I certainly wanna boost up the exposure. I might wanna just crank in a little bit of contrast, but I just wanna be subtle with these alterations of highlights and shadows. In architectural images, I'm a little more aggressive with the clarity slider than I am with other genres of photography. The architecture is just a little bit more forgiving for that. And my main concern at the moment is making sure the interior of the kitchen looks pretty good. I'm not concerned about the exterior at the moment. That's a job for fixing that up in Photoshop. And the fact that we've reduced the contrast there, I'm really not too worried about. But one thing that's looking a little odd is the tiling here. I feel like we're getting a little bit of discoloration and it's becoming quite yellow where I know for a fact it was orange. And I can see a couple of dust spots that I also want to clean up. So I'm gonna go into my spot removal tool and down here in the toolbar, I'm just gonna to visualize the spots just to see where they are. 
and currently I can't actually see them because this setting is quite low and now as I slide that up I can see that I have one up here on the ceiling I have got way more dust spots on my camera sensor than I would care to admit. So the lesson in that is make sure you clean your camera sensor before you go and shoot one of these jobs because those dust spots are going to be on every single photo, every set of images, which is a bit of a nightmare. I could and should have cleaned my sensor once, but now I have to make sure I take care of these dust spots in the whole set of images. Oh, nightmare. But anyway, let's close that tool down. And before we bring this into Photoshop, I just want to show you something because I know somebody out there will be thinking, well, you can actually use the luminosity range to bring back the highlights. And yes, absolutely you can. We could select the brightest parts of the photo. We could come in, we could start dialing back that exposure. And because we're working on a cleaner file now, the HDR file, that will have all of that data to bring back However, I don't really like this approach. It's a bit more fiddly and I prefer to do it in Photoshop. So what I'm gonna do is just delete that mask, right click on this and I'm gonna edit in and I'm gonna to choose to open it as a smart object in Photoshop. It's very important that we choose smart object because that's gonna allow us to set up our file for the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. And then when we bring it all together, it's, it's gonna look great. So I like to stay organized. So the first thing I'm gonna do is double click on the name, call that one base. Now you might think that you want to create two new layers and you might drag that down and you've got a new copy. However, if I make changes to this copy, and let's say we bring the exposure down because we wanna bring back the highlights, for example, and I click okay, watch what happens to both of the layers. Not only have we changed the top layer, we've also changed the underlying layer as well. And that is not what we want to do. So I'm gonna press Control Z to undo that. And I'm just gonna throw that layer away. What we want to do is create a new layer that we can edit and it is not going to affect this base layer. So we do that by right clicking and we come up to this option here, new smart object via copy. And now when I make any changes to this layer, like we did before, drop in the exposure, click OK, we're going to see that it only affects this layer. The underlying layer is left unedited, and that is exactly what we want. So now I'm going to double click that again to open up our camera raw editor, double click the exposure to reset that. And now I'm just going to have a little play around with the highlight settings, the whites, just so that I'm making sure that I have all the details where the highlights are. Now part of the key to this technique is making sure that you don't alter the midtones too much and that's going to allow us to create a nice seamless blend. That's not too bad but I feel that the midtones are just getting a little bit too dark on me and so what I'm going to do is come in to the curve, lift that up and now we have a layer that we can access where the highlights look pretty good. So I'll toggle our before and our after, before and after. The midtones and shadows don't look too dissimilar but the highlights are certainly being recovered in this photo. But the reason I don't just edit my photo like this in the first place and say done is because when you do compare the midtones and the shadows, this version looks much more kind of muddy than this. I like the nice, clean, punchy interior, but I prefer the highlights in this photo. So how do we combine the two? Well, we wanna use a luminosity mask that is basically going to select the brightest parts of the image, the brightest pixels, and it's gonna mask the new layer, which has a much better representation of the highlights. It's gonna mask that in over the top of the base layer that we prefer. So I'm gonna use a tool called Lumenzia that I'm gonna put a link to in the description below. It is probably the best money I have ever spent, apart from my camera and lenses, but the best money I've ever spent on my architectural photography career. It's really inexpensive in the scheme of things and it's gonna allow you to create these masks with a lot of precision very quickly. You can do it through Photoshop with various techniques, um, but it's a much more long-winded way. But if you're doing this all the time, particularly professionally, the way I look at it is time is money and the relatively small investment of about $40 for this uh, panel, it's, it's a game changer, well worth it. Let me show you how you use it. So I'm just gonna hide the layer that we want to mask in for now, the highlights layer. In fact, let me call that highlights just so we can stay organized. And now I'm opening the Lumenzia panel, which at first glance looks a bit daunting, a bit confusing, but it's super simple. On the right hand side, these buttons that say L allow us to create a mask based on the brightest pixels in the image. So that is just clicking that big L there. Conversely, we can select the dark pixels in the image with this. 
and we can tighten up the mask by coming down to more refined numbers. So I find for the highlights, somewhere around L2 generally works pretty well. But if you want to refine things, you've got this slider on the right hand side. So the further we take that down, the more localized and pinpointed that mask is going to be, the higher up we take it the more broad the mask that's created is going to be. Now you don't want to include too much of the interior, but you also don't want to include none of it because things aren't going to look very smooth. So I kind of go somewhere in between. In fact, if we go for three on this slider, which is equivalent just of pressing L3, that's not a bad place to start. And now all I need to do is click mask. And currently we don't see anything because we hid that layer. But now when we reveal that, we can see that that detail outside is reintroduced. And now as I toggle this before and after, you can see what is pretty much a pure white in the original. We are now bringing back all of that detail. And we have the flexibility if we want to grab the opacity slider, just say, you know what, I want some of that effect from outside, but I don't want it at full intensity. I don't want to introduce this kind of blue coloration. You might want to just sort of tickle it in, just tease a bit of that in entirely up to you but what i prefer to do so you've got even more control is create a double mask and you do that by creating a group drop the layer inside a group and then that allows you to actually put a mask on top of that group currently we see everything because the mask is white so i'm just pressing Control i on my keyboard to invert that that's now going to allow me to grab a white brush and wherever i paint with this white brush i'm painting that effect back in but I'll press Control Z to undo that. And you would have noticed as I painted it out here, it's muddying down the walls in the kitchen, which isn't what we want. So we don't want to apply that effect everywhere. That's where this second masking group comes in because it's going to allow us to precisely paint back in that effect where we want it. So we could go for an opacity, say 50%, and just lightly pop in a little bit of detail in those skylights. We could do the same by doing a pass just outside the window there. And you can see as I'm scribbling the mouse over the top here, just how loose you can be because of that original mask being created for us very precisely. So if I press Alt and click on that mask, you can see just how much precision is in that mask. And then that allows us to be much looser with our mask where we're saying, hey, reveal this effect only where we're painting here. And as I say, we do that through that double masking effect by creating a group that we drop that layer into. So here's our before, here's our after. Now I've had this in the past where people watch me do this and they're like, I don't have the time to spend doing this. My clients need my work yesterday. Well, maybe, and there are other alternative methods that you can do, use for getting your photos back much quicker than this. However, here's a couple of points about that. One is, I'm pitching my work not to real estate agents who just want you to get in, get the job back to them as quickly as possible, and their main concern isn't the quality. I'm looking at architects, interior designers, people who are actually gonna pay well for this type of work, and they expect to have the highest quality work given back to them. So absolutely, I'm gonna employ techniques like this to make sure my work looks really, really good, and they'll keep coming back and hiring me again and again. The second point is, this type of editing is actually really quick. Once you understand it, it really doesn't take very long at all. It might seem like it because I'm trying to explain it to you guys and hopefully you can understand it. I'm really trying hard to make it a transparent process that you can take, start adopting and using in your work. And as a consequence of that is, it takes a little while to explain it, but trust me, once you understand it, one new layer for the highlights, one for the shadows, job done, it's really quick. And talking of that, let's do the shadows. So we're going to hide our highlights layer, come back to the base, and we are going to create a new smart object via copy again. And this one is going to be for our shadows. So usually for your shadows, you're wanting to bring up the shadow detail. So for example, boosting up the shadows, boosting up the blacks, just so that you can start to see the information in those very dark shadows. However, in this particular photo file, we don't really have much in the way of the very dark shadows that I really need to see. The information around the dark bits of the cooker here or the shadows around the fridge freezer, we don't really need to see those. One area we could look at introducing a little more detail though is around the front of the actual kitchen bench top itself. And so let's actually do that. We'll just add a bit of contrast, click OK. And it's subtle, but we do have a bit more brightness down here. So if I look at our before and after, we're definitely lifting these shadows here around the front of this cabinetry. So again, let's use Lumenzia to actually create our mask. 
and then we just click the mask button here and it's going to apply this mask to the layer that we have selected which is our shadows layer so if I toggle out before and after you can just see that those blacks and shadows are being lifted up ever so slightly and then what we, we can do if we want to is actually manipulate that mask further so if you press alt and click on the mask you can actually see what it's created for us and if we want to we can come in and grab a curves or level adjustment if we want to and just kind of tweak that effect if we want to and if I just want it to affect the cabinetry and nothing else all I need to do is grab the gradient tool and make sure I have black selected and then just click and drag a gradient down there and that's just going to absolutely hide the top part of that mask so now we just have a subtle brightening around the front of that cabinetry and it's done with a lot of precision if we look at our mask again that is the mask we're using those are the shadows being lifted and that is the highlights being reintroduced. As a consequence of bringing back the highlights and the shadows in this way, you can often end up with a relatively flat looking image, but don't panic about that. As long as all that information exists in the file, you can just do a simple S curve on this. But what I usually prefer to do is either throw it into Color Effects Pro or Luminar Neo just to put those finishing touches on this. But let me show you how you do it inside of Photoshop. So we'll just fix up the contrast and also the slight discoloration that we have going on through those whites. So we'll fix both of those issues. And then for this one, we'll just call it done. So before I can do either of those things, what I like to do is actually create a stamped visible layer and just do a little bit of retouching on the photo. And if there's any areas like those dust spots that we have already taken care of, or a big ceiling extractor fan or heater, whatever this is, uh, and you want to get rid of it, I usually do that. And using content aware fill is a really great way to do that. So all you need to do is select the area you want to get rid of, press Shift F5 on your keyboard, and make sure that in the content section, you have content aware fill, click OK, and Photoshop normally does a pretty good job of cleaning up that area. If it doesn't, all you need to do is just run it again and it usually just takes care of any little anomalies that it missed the first time around. And if for any reason you feel like you're just not winning with that, you can always go back to the traditional stamp tool, sample from another area, maybe change our opacity to 50% just so that we can build it up with a little more subtlety. And we'll just go with that. And we could do the same here, just sample a little bit of the wire. This time I want to make sure I'm at 100% opacity because I don't want any of this other wire showing. And once I've done that, I could just do a very rough selection. Use content aware fill. And you can see that it's done a pretty poor job just here. And give it another chance. It's been particularly stubborn about that bit. So again, I will just come in and I've got a soft edge brush. So that's just going to feather that off towards there and to be honest although that's not a perfect cleanup job by any means no one's really going to notice I'm just going to change the background to a medium grey just to get a different comparison to my tonal values just while I'm working on the contrast so for example if you have a black background or you have a white background you're going to get a very different kind of feel for your photo overall and I do recommend just switching between these while you're working on them just to actually see do your blacks look pure black how do your whites look against a white background? And you can do that just by right clicking on the canvas itself and then choosing between black, medium gray or a custom color. And I just set my custom color to white. So <laughs> you can set it to anything you like, but obviously the most useful for us and our purposes is a white. So obviously at the most basic level, we could just add a generic curve to our photo where we're brightening up the highlights, darkening down the shadows. You know, just a basic S curve. However, it doesn't really give us much control over the photo. So what I prefer to do again is just come in and use Lumenzia because you can also select into the midtones as well. And the fact that our whole mask has nearly gone white just shows you that we really are lacking contrast at the moment. So I'll tighten that up. So currently we've just got a midtone selection going on. And rather than just clicking mask this time, what I'm going to do is click on the curves tool here and what that's going to do is apply the mask that we have here this luminosity mask that's talking into the midtones and allow us to adapt a curve based only on those midtones so now i can pull those down bring those whites up if i want to and that's giving me a much nicer refined pop in the image 
unlike the approach before where we weren't applying a mask. So if I take that mask off, you can see that that's applying the effect everywhere and down in the shadows particularly just around here we're really making that too dark without the mid-tone mask so again if we apply the mid-tone mask things look much better and not as aggressive through those shadows i might try and do a second brightening pass just through this area here so again i'm going to jump into lumenzia and if the mid-tone selection isn't quite doing it and neither are the light selection we have the option of going for a light mid-tone in between the two. And as you can see, the walls and the panelling here are the predominant things selected. So again, I'm just going to jump in and put a curve adjustment based on this selection. And obviously we don't see any difference between what we've just done because currently we haven't made any adjustments to the curves. But now if I grab that curve and start brightening it up, you can see that we're lifting the brightness value of the whites here. It's doing it through the whole photo. So again, what I could do is come in and just remove that effect mostly from the top. I'm going to drop a gradient over the top, not with 100%, 77%. So we're reducing that effect probably a little bit too much, particularly around the sides. So again, I'm just going to come in, make my brush a bit bigger and just finesse that mask. You can actually see the transition line just here, so I want to make sure I take care of that. Okay, let's take care of the color bleeds on the ceiling, the walls, and the cabinetry itself. And I'm going to do that with a hue saturation layer. And of course, as we desaturate the photo, we're taking away any of those color casts. But what I like to do is actually push this into the positive realm so I can really get a sense of what colors are actually affecting and contaminating the walls. And then once you can actually see them, you can make a decision about which ones you want to remove. So obviously we're very much orangey up the top here, so I can just click on that. That's gonna target the reds and bring those down. We're even getting a bit of green here. We're actually getting a lot of different colors across the board. Yellow is really gonna help us, so we can start to take some of that out. And we are getting a little bit of blue going on as well. So I'm just clicking and dragging. We can click left and right once we have this little tool selected here and that just lets us sample in the photo with this eyedropper tool and then reduce or increase that particular color. So I'm just gonna reduce these down. I know this looks awful at the moment, don't panic. I'm gonna come back to the master now and now I'm just gonna ease this back. And yes, I know it still looks awful, but what I'm gonna do now is come in, come to the select option here and choose color range. And with my fuzziness and range, I don't know, set somewhere around there, that's fine. I'm just gonna click on an area of the white and then I can choose the plus icon next to the eyedropper and that's gonna allow me to add to that selection. So I'm just gonna work my way around the white areas that I wanna clean up. So I'm just clicking and dragging. Certainly wanna make sure that these cabinets here are cleaned up. So I'm just gonna click on those. I'm just clicking once. Maybe let's get a little bit of that blue there. And if you sample a color you don't want, you come in and just select the eyedropper with the minus next to it, and then you can actually subtract those colors away. But it's a little bit of a dance back and forth if you want to get this precise. I usually like to just get it pretty close. I'm just going to go with that. I'm going to click OK. And currently our hue saturation layer is hidden, but watch this when I turn this on. Watch all of the whites. The whites with that color contamination, particularly on the front panel here and the ceiling with the orange, Watch as I toggle the before and after, we have definitely cleaned up all of those whites. Again, that's a super quick technique, once you understand it, that's gonna really help you clean up the colors in your photo. So no need for a flash for purifying those colors. We can do that all in Photoshop. And there are definitely pros and cons of shooting with and without a flash, and it's a very loaded subject. So I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If you're smart enough to see the benefits of this exposure blending technique, to really enhance those highlights and shadows, bring them back, all that good detail, but you're a little intimidated by the approach and you're not quite sure what to do. Greg Benz, who makes this uh, software, this panel for Photoshop, has actually done an exceptional bit of training that you can get along with the panel. I actually bought it, even though I thought, oh, yeah, I know all of that, but it actually really helped me to understand and some of the concepts I just wasn't quite sure about. It just really uh, expanded my knowledge of how to use that panel. Like I say, game changer for architectural photography, link in the description below. To be honest, there are still a couple of things that aren't quite right with this. So the window frames themselves, they're still just a little bit too bright and you can see they're close to the mid-tones when I sampled their color there. So I really wanna make sure that we're bringing them down closer towards black. 
whilst not bringing down the mid-tones too much. I'm gonna press Control I to invert my mask and then I can literally just come and paint that in. Absolutely, again, I could have used Lumenzia just to make a selection around those, just to fix those up, but this way it's just as quick. And I do feel that the floor is oversaturated as well. So I'm gonna just create another hue saturation layer, sample the yellows there, and just bring those down. And because it's only the floor I want to affect, not the cabinetry, I'm gonna make sure that I have a black gradient that's gonna remove that effect from the mask. So I'm just pulling down and I hold shift to make sure that's constrained to 90 degrees. And my gradient is still set to 77% from earlier, so I'll just crank that up. And now we can toggle our before and after and see that we are only reducing the saturation on the floor only. As much as I want to say it is, you know what, this image isn't finished yet. I have to do it. I'm going to come into Filter. I'm going to come to Nick Collection Color Effects Pro. And I'm just going to pop on an architectural interior finisher. And we look at our before and our after. You can just see that we have a pretty tepid image by comparison with what we've made in Photoshop. And look at all that lovely, rich detail that is brought out. So before and after. If I zoom in one to one onto the cabinetry here, and I really hope this is showing up on a YouTube video, but the level of detail from what we have in Photoshop to what we can bring about through Color Effects Pro, architects and designers, they absolutely love it. They're like, oh, I can see all of the details that was there in my design. Thanks so much. You know, it's a real win for you as an architectural photographer or even a real estate photographer. This tool can really help you level up your imagery. So once you're happy, you just click apply. And now we have our Color Effects Pro version with added detail, added contrast. Looks actually so much better. I really love using that as a finishing tool. If you want to get it, I've got a link in the description below. And now I really am going to call that finished between this, our original image, and you can see just how far we've come with this. So here's our before, here's our after. Probably a five to 10 minute edit if I wasn't explaining every step along the way. If you feel like you're the boss of editing and you've got it under control and you just wanna start making more money from your architectural photography shoots, I put together this video which explains a bit about licensing and how I optimize the income from every shoot I do. So check out that video there. I'll see you there and thank you very much for watching. Appreciate your time.